Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. The blockade on the road to Winnipeg's Brady Landfill has been taken down. It went up roughly two weeks ago after the Manitoba government announced it will not support a search of landfills for the remains of missing and murdered Indigenous women. Tamara Pimentel has more. Elder Geraldine Shingu smudges a red dress mural painted on the road to the Brady landfill. It's where a blockade stood moments before. They just come in and sweep everything away, but they didn't sweep away all our prayers. They didn't sweep away all our, all our voices or our way. We're still going to carry on. The city of Winnipeg removed the blockade Tuesday morning in response to an injunction order that was granted last week. Inspector Gord Spado with Winnipeg Police says it was done in a peaceful way. Protesters removed things they wanted to keep off of the roadway and that allowed the city to come in and assist us in removing the material that uh, was still blocking the road. Protesters had been blocking the road for two weeks after Manitoba's Premier Heather Stephenson made the decision to not search the Brady or Prairie Green landfills. It is believed that Morgan Harris, Mercedes Myron and Buffalo Woman can be in either landfill. At a press conference on Monday, experts told the media that a search is feasible and has been done many times before. And those calling on a search say it isn't over. Derek Nipanak is chief of Pine Creek First Nation and a cousin to Tanya Nipanak, whose remains may also be in the Brady landfill. She went missing in 2011. Police believe she was killed by an alleged serial killer. For a very long time, we've been witnessing our loved ones ending up in this dump. And it's heartbreaking and it's tragic. And oftentimes we don't have the words to even speak about the violence that we witness in our lives day to day. A camp called Camp Morgan will remain standing near the Brady landfill and a new one is expected to be set up outside the Canadian Museum for Human Rights in Winnipeg and that will be called Camp Mercedes. Before allowing the city to sweep up debris from the blockade, Shingoose held a pipe ceremony to bring closure. Well, we need to continue their voice, bring their voice because they want to go home. They want their families to take them home and rest. Like they, they deserve a proper burial. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Winnipeg. NDP Member of Parliament Leah Gazan has written a submission to the United Nation to a United Nations panel calling for a study into the failure of all levels of government to support a search for the remains of two Indigenous women. She joins us now in studio. Leah, thanks for taking some time for us. Uh, let's start with the developments today, though, uh, and the removal of the blockade at the Brady Landfill. Uh, just your thoughts on that coming down less than two weeks after it went up. Well, I think uh, the, the, the bigger point here is the fact that, you know, families are having uh, to plead uh, with all levels of government uh, to seek justice for their, their loved ones uh, is unfortunate. Uh, you know, uh, certainly uh, the uh, protests so far have been peaceful and I know that there's plans to move to the Human Rights Museum with support uh, from uh, folks at the Human Rights Museum and I continue to support the uh, need to search the landfills. Now, you've recently written the United Nations to call for action. Can you tell us about that? Well, I actually uh, wrote uh, a submission to the Special Rapporteur back in Fe February about the failure of all levels of government uh, in responding to the crisis of murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. This is a follow-up uh, to the submission I made in, in February. February um, to uh, the expert me mechanism on the rights of Indigenous peoples to review the need uh, for a study for international uh, oversight uh, of the uh, search of, of the landfills because of examples of ongoing systemic violence. Uh, certainly uh, the women that uh, were victims uh, that we're currently searching for, Mercedes Myron, 
uh, Morgan Harris and Buffalo woman were all uh, victims of failures of system, systemic racism. You know, now this is another example, and I think it requires international oversight uh, to make sure families and certainly the Indigenous com communities are protected from this ongoing systemic racism that persists in Canada. Now you mentioned it, uh, you know, there has been this jurisdictional fight over uh, who said do what and pay for what when it comes to the landfill search. Uh, Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller again today taking some shots at the Manitoba Premier. Uh, how do we move past that? Well, I mean, I think the bigger picture here is the government passed Bill C-15 to fully adopt the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, Winnipeg has signed up uh, as a human rights uh, city, uh, you know, uh, and that means that they need to uphold the basic human rights that are that are articulated in articles in UNDRIP. That includes Article 7, Articles 21 and 22 that certainly apply in this case and I would argue as well article uh, 12 they have the feds have fiduciary uh, obligations here but also the city and province uh, have obligations here I do uh, agree uh, and I'm hoping that the premier will reconsider uh, her position but I call on all levels of government to stop uh, pointing fingers to stop with the jurisdictional games and do the right thing and uh, search the landfills and provide the families whatever they uh, should uh, need for justice and that could include uh, anything uh, from that uh, to providing actual compensation for the families. Let's not forget the province continued to use that landfill uh, after the police came uh, out and said that they suspected that uh, certainly Morgan Harris and Mercedes Myron were in the landfill. That was under their jurisdiction and certainly an act of contaminating uh, an act of crime scene. So I, I think we need to stop pointing fingers and everybody needs to do what they need to do uh, to uphold human rights human rights that are articulated in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, families deserve justice. Uh, our communities deserve justice. Just uh, quickly and lastly here, Leah, uh, where do you think things go next with the possibility of a land search? Do you think we'll see a, a search happen before the snow flies? Well, you know, that's certainly not up to me, but I can tell you I'm going to continue uh, supporting families, uh, supporting our community. Uh, you know, let's not forget the federal government to date has only responded to two calls to justice of the 231 calls uh, for justice in the National Inquiry into Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls. Uh, this has become a normalized genocide in this country. This has become normalized violence, and I'm going to continue to speak up against it. Leah, we'll have to leave it there. I appreciate uh, you taking the time for us here today. Thank you so much for having me. Well, still in Winnipeg, it was an emotional day in a packed courtroom as two Anishinaabe men convicted of murder 50 years ago were declared innocent. King's Bench Chief Justice Glenn Joyle told uh, Brian Anderson and Alan A.J. Woodhouse they were innocent and deserved an apology. He cited systemic and individual racism in the men's convictions for the 1974 murder of Ting Fong Chan in downtown Winnipeg. Innocence Canada lawyers Jerome Kennedy and James Lockyer represented the pair. Anderson and Woodhouse spoke to reporters gathered outside the court. When I was taking the stand, you know, the, the system in, in itself, the way it is written, it's written really well. It's just the practice of it, it's a, that's where we fail. And I think the judge covered that area also when he said that we are human. But that was also an excuse because we claim to be, or at least we pursue to be perfect when we fail because we don't want to pursue that area. Or else we don't want to admit we, we could be wrong. Well, life, like, you know, I need, I, I, I want to live too. But... I need to be free, have a happy life. I have a good family, people support me, <clears throat> and that's where it's at. So, life is good. The men's lawyers wouldn't say if Woodhouse and Anderson will seek compensation, but say the case will have broader implications for all Indigenous people wrongfully convicted in Canada. You can find much more on this story on our website, aptnnews.ca. 
A new report details a culture of sexual misconduct, harassment and discrimination at the Assembly of First Nations. That story is coming up after the break. Welcome back. With the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in the forefront for many years now, some say it's time for another inquiry, this time with a focus on men and boys. APTN's Tamara Pimentel spoke with a mother bringing her son's story to Parliament Hill. Eight years after her son's death, Rochelle Dubois is making the trek from Regina to Ottawa to call for a national inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous men, boys and two-spirit people. Our family was deeply affected by the health care system, by the justice system, um, by the education system, all of it. We've, and we're tired of, of being mistreated. Making a stop in downtown Winnipeg, Dubois speaks of her son Haven Dubois, who at just 14 years old died in 2015. Haven drowned in a creek in Regina during school hours. A coroner's report found marijuana to be a contributing factor and deemed his death accidental. Rochelle feels it was not an accident and has been calling on the Saskatchewan Coroner's Service for an inquest into her son's death. After years of fighting for answers, the province confirmed an inquest will happen. Alongside Haven's photo is one of Rochelle's uncle, Stephen, who she says was mistreated on the last days of his life while in care at a Regina hospital. This march is also for him. I do believe that every First Nation has somebody on their reserve who has been mistreated by the health care system or has been affected by a missing and murdered Indigenous loved one. APTN first met Rochelle at a camp outside the Saskatchewan legislature in 2018, a demonstration in response to the deaths of Colton Bushy and Tina Fontaine and the acquittals of the accused in both cases. But for Rochelle, it was also a fight for her son. In Winnipeg, Sandy Banman supports the call for a national inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous men and boys. Her son Carl Banman was 31 years old when he went missing from Morden, Manitoba in 2011. His body was found in a creek outside of town. No, Banman has been a strong anymore. advocate during the MMIW movement, but says it's now it's time to switch gears. I still feel like we have to start raising up our men. We have to start realizing that they're getting murdered at two or three times, four times the rate as the women, and they're just as sacred. The men are going missing for much different reasons, so I think there should be different things that they look at and try to um, prevent and solve what's going on. It's outrageous how many men are getting murdered. Sandy has never met Rochelle in person, but supports all that she is doing to bring the issue to light. For me, it feels like she's walking for my son too. She's walking for my Carlos too. Rochelle and her supporters have over 2,000 kilometres to go until making it to Parliament Hill, where they hope to meet with the Assembly of First Nations. A timeline for Haven's inquest is yet to be determined. The Saskatchewan government says the public will be notified at least two weeks before it is scheduled. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Winnipeg. A new report was tabled at last week's Assembly of First Nations that highlights sexual orientation and gender-based discrimination within the organization. Here's Sarah Connors with Reaction. Unwanted touching, bullying and comments about pornography. They're just some of the findings of a new report on sexual orientation and gender-based discrimination within the AFN. The independent investigative review was presented to chiefs last week during the 44th General Assembly. It revealed a long-standing organizational culture of sexual misconduct, predatory practice, harassment and discrimination. We had fallen into a culture of keeping um, our stories quiet and not taking action. The AFN Yukon region strongly supported a resolution to launch the review. 
It hopes its findings will showcase the need for change and healing within the organization. Leaders, and we need to create a, a safe environment um, for all, all individuals working um, to advance the issues of Indigenous governments and cultures. But I don't think this is something that only happens at the AFN. For Chief Ali Bear, the AFN is not different than many other colonized institutions. She says it now has the opportunity to be a role model when it comes to promoting a safe work environment. If we don't talk about it, then we're never going to have a solution for it. And it's going to continue to happen to the younger generations that continue to come into these spaces. AFN Interim National Chief Joanna Bernard said its executive committee was deeply disturbed by the findings and would enforce measures to provide a respectful workplace, including a zero-tolerance policy. We have to take action. There is no room for um, setting aside policy changes and procedural changes anymore. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. Thanks, Sarah. One more quick break, and then we will bring you plenty of highlights from today's action at the North American Indigenous Games. Stick around. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. Yesterday, you may remember we had an amazing photo of a teepee, and here's another. Teresa Trifo sent in this beauty. This teepee set up at the St. Louis Cultural Camp. We're not sure where that is. Let us know because I see photos from there all the time. Uh, send us your photos. It be our next photo of the day to share at aptn.ca. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, 27 with showers in Halifax, 25 in Fredericton, rain and 19 in Kujuwak, cloudy and 22 for Nain, 25 with rain in Montreal, 22 and rain for Val d'Or. 21 with cloud in Sault Ste. Marie, rain and 24 for North Bay. Chile, 15 with showers in Thunder Bay, 20 in rain in Capas Casing. 23 in Churchill, 19 in God's Lake. 25 with rain in Winnipeg, showers and 23 in Dauphin. Rain and 22 for Regina, 18 with rain in North Battleford. 26 in Uranium City, 18 with showers for Metal Lake. In Northern Alberta, showers and 24 for High Level and Peace River. Rain in Edmonton and a high of 20, 28 under sunny skies for Lethbridge. Sun's out and 26 for Vancouver, 32 under the sun in Kamloops. Smoke and 23 for Prince George, 25 in Smithers. 27 with rain in Old Crow, 22 with showers for Whitehorse. The smoke will be around and 28 for Yellowknife and Fort Simpson. 22 for Saks Harbor, 25 in Inuvik. Sunny and 20 for Baker Lake, 17 in Whale Cove and Arviette, 12 in Resolute, 8 in Arctic Bay. Well, as this year's North American Indigenous Games continue, lacrosse is one of three traditional Indigenous sports. Prior to one of the marquee games between Wisconsin and host Nova Scotia, there was a small opening ceremony. Our Daryl Stranger has those highlights. With cheers and support from the packed stands at the RBC Center, the 16 and under men's Nova Scotia team entered the arena with a traditional dance. I'm so excited to welcome everyone here tonight. Following their entrance, there were words from Wagmacook Chief Norman Bernard. A ceremonial face-off was the final step in the small ceremony before the game. The game between Wisconsin and Nova Scotia was tightly contested throughout with plenty of hard-hitting action. Make it. Let's go, Nova Scotia! Goals from Nova Scotia had them out to an early 4-0 lead. But Team Wisconsin was not going down without a fight. The game remained close until the final buzzer. Let's go, Nova Scotia! 
which saw the hosts walk away with a 7-5 victory. For Nova Scotia's Brody Boyd, to play in front of the home fans and to family was an experience like no other. That was, that was crazy. But we never play in this rink, and the other ones don't got stands, so this was nice to play in. Uh, yeah, just play for, our, play for our family. Despite the loss, Team Wisconsin players said the atmosphere gave them energy throughout. The cheering is almost like just like another like boost to yourself. Like, you know, you make a big play, or the team makes a big play, you know, I do something, you know. It's just like the crowd is nothing I've ever experienced before. Usually when we play like field lacrosse, there's not usually that many people, but I came out here, I was like, holy. Oh. It's like all these, all these people just came here to see us play. So I'm, I, I was amazed how many people popped, I came out. So it was nice. Boyd has a passion for lacrosse that includes playing for others. I play for family, I play for my teammates, I play for everyone else, and it's just fun. It's, yeah, I just play for the ones who can't. Even with all of the slashing, hitting, and trash talk, Everyone came together at the end of the game to meet up and give their respects, something the Wisconsin players enjoyed. I got hit over there. I felt my back crack when I hit the wall, and then there was a lot of trash talk between us, and then um, I thought that we wasn't going to get along after the game, but after the game, we all shook up, and then, like, we was all just, you know, like, glad to make it out. You know, it was actually fun. I love how, you know, we all come together, and after the game, we just... You know, after all the intense, you know, like just shoving and stuff and, you know, pushing is just we all like indigenous people at the end of the day so we can just all come together and really appreciate the sport. Daryl Stranger, APT National News, Dartmouth. Great action there. Nice to have the home team win. Nice to be playing in front of big crowds too. Well, official competition started yesterday at the North American Indigenous Games. And several sports, including volleyball, opened to enthusiastic crowds. The under-19 volleyball team from uh, Alberta and Nunavut played their opening games this morning. A loud crowd was on hand to support both teams. While the points were traded back and forth, Team Alberta survived a late rally from Team Nunavut to take the win in two straight sets. Oh, that was a pretty good game. Our first set was a little rough off the start, but we picked it up and we got it going. We started off like a little bit not too great. Our serves were a little bit me messed up, but it was good.